Hi everyone, this is Doorstep Science Series 1 and we're talking natural enemies, those tiny farmhands who work for free. So let's get into it. Today we're looking at integrated pest management with a focus on biological control of crop pests, particularly generalist predators. So in the case of natural enemies, at a high level, we have generalists and we have specialists. So generalists are those that aren't so fussy with what they eat. They all attack a really broad range of prey. So think about a fox, for example. We know they tend to eat whatever they can find. And then we have the specialists. Among other animals, as an example, you might think about an anteater, which is highly evolved to dig out and stick its long tongue into ant nests. We'll focus on these specialists in our next episode. The advantage for the generalist is that it has a reduced risk of running out of food. If one food source runs out, it can turn its attention to another. In the case of specialists, because they only attack one species or a small number of species, when their food source runs out, they need to move out of a crop in search of more food or that population will die out. The other distinction we can make is between residents and transients. The former are largely confined to a crop or a paddock, whereas the latter is much more mobile and they will move from paddock to paddock or property to property. And in some cases, they can move quite large distances. The distinction between residents and transients is quite important because depending on whether you have a resident or transient beneficial population in your paddock, will largely dictate the impact that certain agronomic practices will have on the health and the build-up of those natural enemies. Ladybird beetles are a really important natural enemy group. They're generalists, so they have a broad diet. We won't go into how to identify an adult. They're fairly distinct. Although I will say there are many types of ladybird beetle in Australia and worldwide. Most of them are predators, although there is a type that you may see around called the 28-spotted ladybird beetle, which is in fact a plant pest. It's a herbivore. So as with everything in the biological world, there's always an exception to the rule. These beneficials are fairly important because it's the larvae and the adults that are predatory. This is not the case with all beneficials. Much like caterpillars and butterflies having different feeding habits, the same is true for different life stages of beneficial insects. But not in this case, at least. The larvae look quite different to adults. They have long bodies. They're obviously wingless. They're typically grey in colour with orange or yellow stripes. And this is what the pupae look like. What the ladybird beetles typically do is forage for prey on plants. They don't spend a lot of time on the ground looking for prey. They spend most of their time up on the plant, in the canopy, eating aphids, but not only aphids, they'll eat small caterpillars, they'll eat mites, and they also like to feed on caterpillar eggs and other eggs they find up in the plant canopy. This is a photo of a crabbit eating a slug. The major way to differentiate these beetles from cockchafer adults or dung beetle adults, apart from differences in behaviour, is typically that they have this hot water bottle shape and they have a con slight constriction here, the middle of the body. And also their bodies are quite elongated. Crabid larvae look very different. This is because the species is from the Coleoptera group, which is the same as the scarabs, and they undergo metamorphosis in the same way as a scarab. So as you may be thinking, it would be very easy to mistake a carabid beetle larvae from something like a true wireworm, which is a plant pest species. That's very true. And it's important to make sure you know the difference in the paddock. Carabids spend a lot of their time on the soil surface, as opposed to the ladybird beetle, which are further up in the canopy, as I'd mentioned. So they're going after a different suite of prey. This is what a hoverfly looks like. Their name is very apt, and it's not uncommon to see it helicoptering around nectar sources in spring and summer. It's quite a small fly. It looks a bit like a bee or a wasp if you were to see it out of the corner of your eye because it has that banding pattern. In the case of hoverfly, the adult is not actually a predator. As I said, it feeds on nectar and pollen, but the larvae is. They're small and they're generally green, 
and it's a very common species to see in spring and summer in southeastern Australia. The larvae in some cases will have a white stripe running down their back and they tend to only be around one centimetre long, if that, and they just love to eat aphids. Green lacewings tend to be more common up north, although we have seen them around our base in Melbourne, while the brown lacewing tend to be more common in the southern region of Australia. The adults are small, they're fragile looking, they've got these long antennae and these beautiful lacy wings. The adult green lacewings do a bit of predation and the brown are primarily predators. The larvae are the most important life stage, however, when it comes to um, control of plant pests. These larvae are the ones that have the sickle-shaped mouth parts and they stick out in front. And they'll prey on aphids, mites, caterpillar eggs and small caterpillars. They won't particularly go for the larger prey. This is a green lacewing larvae. And you might notice that it looks quite different from the brown lacewing larvae you can see here. The reason it looks quite different is related to its behaviour. Green lacewing larvae will throw aphid casts on their back, maybe for camouflage or possibly as a mobile trophy case. Everyone needs a hobby, am I right? So the green lacewing has spines that stick out for use as, as this trophy cabinet, its own personal pool room. And the larvae of both types have that sickle-shaped mouth part. They have these very long slender bodies and they have three pairs of very functional legs. I'll also make the point that spiders are one of the most important natural enemies that we have in the paddock and they are also generalists. We don't fully know what the impact is of generalist natural enemies in a crop. There are still gaps in our knowledge, although the efforts in the paddock are very steadily becoming recognised and appreciated more and more. We know that a single ladybird can consume more than 2,000 aphids in its life. We also know that most beneficials are highly mobile, and this means that they can move into a paddock and follow prey, and often what we see is a lag, where the beneficials will move in after the pest has arrived. That's obviously needed because they need to be eating something because they won't be there if there's nothing to eat in the first place. And the trick, of course, is that lag time. Monitoring that lag time and estimating if beneficial populations will catch up, and if not, do we need to intervene with some other control option? So what can we do to encourage and support our little farmhands? Well, I wasn't being completely truthful when I titled this video Natural Enemies, those tiny farmhands that work for free. They do require some payment. Often the adult life stage needs additional food sources, such as nectar, to survive. So we can preserve native vegetation that have good sources of nectar throughout the year and also serve as a shelter for these species. Release of beneficials is not economically viable in some growing systems, but it may be considered in others, such as in protected cropping. Another thing you can do while monitoring for pests is not just look for the pest, but also think about taking note of the beneficials that you see and consider what the beneficials might be doing. Will they be controlling that pest that is causing problems? And if so, does this mitigate the need for applying chemistry? So hopefully you're a bit more aware of your generalist natural enemies and how to identify them in the field. So join us for our next episode of Doorstep Science. We'll be taking a close look up at the even more microscopic world of parasitoid wasps. Small stature, big dreams. Doorstep Science, it's our way of delivering good science straight to your door. <laughs>